Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us wherever you are in the world and hello to those watching on YouTube afterwards. We're very proud of the fact that these webinars have been viewed live from over 70 different countries, which is amazing. A special shout out to our guests today who have stayed up extra late and started early to be here with us today. So strong coffees all around. For those of you that have joined us before, it's lovely to see you again. But for those of you who don't know my voice by now, my name is Holly and I'm part of the marketing team here at Lynx. If this is your first time joining us, you can watch our lockdown content on our Learn With Links page on our website. Although we hoped 2021 would be different, unfortunately, we still can't get together just yet. So here at Lynx, we're continuing our online events with our free online technical training webinars, industry panel sessions, and our latest webinar programme, the Distinguished Industry Speaker Series. 2021 is going to be our best content year yet. So keep an eye out on our virtual events page to find more information about our exciting content and more importantly, get access to the relevant registration pages. We want this session to be interactive. So if you have a question, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of the Zoom page and our special guests today will get these answered. We have joining us today, David Teach, Network Architect at the University of Oregon and Lead Engineer for Root Views. Philip Smith, Senior Network Engineer from NSRC, which is the Network Startup Resource Centre, and Mo Shifji, Senior Network Engineer from Lynx. This session is recorded and will be uploaded to our Lynx website and YouTube channel. That's it from me. Let's get started. Okay. Well, uh, thank you everyone for joining us uh, today. We're excited to be able to present some of the new things that we're doing uh, with route views and how it applies to our network operators community uh, at Lynx. And I hope you guys find it interesting. Um, if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to drop them in the chat and uh, our wonderful uh, Lynx folks here will um, relay them to me and help help us uh, get them answered. Uh, so without further ado, I'll jump right into it. So my, as uh, Holly mentioned, my name is David Teach. Uh, I'm the lead engineer of RouteViews and um, the network architect at the University of Oregon. And we're just going to be discussing a little bit today uh, about the, some of the new tools and features that we've been bringing to the RouteViews platform over the last year and a half. Um, so as we get into that, just a little bit of background about RouteViews, uh, if you're not familiar, it's a collaborative routing looking glass uh, to share BGP views amongst network operators and researchers. Uh, it was founded at the University of Oregon uh, University of Oregon's Advanced Network Technology Center in 1995. We have data archives that go all the way back to 1997, and we have about 30 terabytes of compressed data today. Uh, the group is currently led by the network engineering team at the University of Oregon, that's me, uh, with assistance from the Network Startup Research, uh, Research Center, NSRC, um, as, you could, as you've met, uh, Philip, and some of uh, the engineers from the Energy Sciences Network. Uh, a little, little bit about the NSRC. Uh, it's here to support the growth of the global internet infrastructure by providing engineering assistance, collaborative technical workshops, training, and other resources to universities, research, and education networks worldwide. They're partially funded by the IRNC program of the National Science Foundation and Google with other con contributions from public and private organizations. The University of Oregon is a public research institute in Eugene, Oregon. Uh, we were founded in 1876. Uh, the U of O is renowned for its research prowess and commitment to teaching both NSRC and RouteViews are based at the U of O. Uh, so here's a quick rundown of the collector footprint for route views. Uh, as you can see, we've we've got a pretty diverse, uh, geographically diverse um, footprint in terms of where our collectors are located. I'm not gonna try and read this entire list out. Uh, obviously, uh, you could see that London Lynx uh, is here today um, and I'm, I'm happy that we're able to have a collector there and 
excited to show you some of the things that you guys can do with the route views collector at links. So just a couple of peering stats here. Uh, we see about 260 million prefixes, 745 uh, peering sessions, give or take. And we see about 288 unique autonomous systems numbers. And if you want to get an up-to-date look at that peering information, we have a link down there at the bottom of the page. So what, what I, exactly is a route views collector? Uh, well, in most cases, it's uh, commodity hardware off the shelf. It's a, it's a 1U box, um, anywhere from 8 to 16 cores, 32 to four, uh, 64 gigs of RAM, uh, 400 gigs of storage, and 1 to 10 gigabit Ethernet, depending on uh, the exchange we're at. Uh, and then we run a, an open source routing software called FRR, which is our BGP daemon. Um, we also have some older collectors that run Quagga, which was the uh, what FRR was forked from, and they all run on top of Linux and CentOS. We do have one hardware uh, router. It's a Cisco ASR, and it runs iOS XE. So we at RouteViews have two different deployment models. Uh, you might be familiar with both of them. Uh, you'll certainly be familiar with the one here at Lynx. Uh, we have the multi-hop model, which is nice for anyone that might not be at an exchange where RouteViews is at. Um, we use eBGP multi-hop, so essentially if you can reach our collector, you can peer with us. The problem with that model is, in a lot of cases, uh, we may be... Um, uh, those peerings are subject to the routing anomalies that we're trying to capture in route views. So it's not ideal from a, uh, a research or network operations perspective if you're relying on that data. Um, we much more so prefer people to uh, peer with us at an internet exchange like Lynx. Um, we get a, a more geographically diverse view from each um, exchange that we peer at. Uh, and we get a lot more peering diversity that way as well. So our data collection and archival is based on MRT data or multi-threaded routing toolkit. Uh, it's an IETF standard. It's been around for a while. There's uh, a lot of different vendors that support that standard. Uh, and what's great about MRT is it, it provides a standard for dumping routing information to a binary file. Uh, it's very compact, so we're able to archive uh, a very lot or large amount of data in a relatively small amount of storage space. Uh, route views MRT dumps consist of uh, BGP ribs and updates. Ribs are dumped every two hours, and our updates are dumped every 15 minutes. Uh, MRT files are bzipped uh, and are synced back to our uh, archival host, which is archive.routeviews.org. Um, and you can access those via HTTP, FTP, and rsync. Uh, there's a number of different tools that are uh, able to read MRT data. We've listed a couple of them here. Uh, this is a, by no means exhaustive. Um, as you can see, there's a number in various different uh, programming languages. The two that I would probably like to highlight is Kata's uh, LibParse BGP and their BGP stream tool. Um, and we'll actually be able to give you a demonstration of those tools um, after the presentation here. So the, some of the use cases that we see for the network operations community uh, I think are, are fairly uh, obvious for the folks on this call. You know, uh, BGP is the backbone of the global routing infrastructure. Uh, we need to ensure its stability. And in order to do that, we need to constantly monitor that routing infrastructure. Um, RouteViews helps to achieve that goal by providing a command line or looking glass interface for anyone and everyone that's able to telnet to a collector. Uh, we provide prefix vis visibility, uh, you can verify convergence, path stability. You're also able to compare local, regional, and global views. 
uh, and it's a great tool for BGP troubleshooting, uh, specifically reachability, uh, but really anything within BGP uh, you'll be able to see in route views. Uh, there are some research use cases uh, that we tend to, to highlight and uh, research is a big part of what continues to uh, help route views uh, maintain its you know, current presence on the various exchanges that we connect to. Um, one of the big ones that we've seen recently in the past uh, couple of years is BGP anomaly and dynamics um, in terms of you know, RPKI, uh, route leaks, BGP hijacks. Uh, those are all very interesting from a research perspective. Um, we also see a lot of research into network optimization, growth, aggregation, uh, both in V4 and V6, um, and address provenance is yet another interesting uh, uh, caveat of the research community. Uh, there's roughly 500 research publications that have used route views data, and if you're interested in those, you can check out the link at the bottom as well. So this is, um, I'm going to give you kind of a brief rundown of what uh, I've kind of considered generation one of the route views data distribution model. Um, so as we've kind of discussed here, everything is uh, file based storage based on our MRT data format. Uh, it's asynchronous. So uh, you aren't delivered that message or that file um, immediately. You have to go retrieve it after it's been delivered to um, our archival service or host. Uh, manual retrieval, sequencing, and consolidation. There's no post-processing, so that's a, another thing that you would have to do if you were wanting to use our data as it is today. Uh, it's a centralized model. We only have that uh, collection point on uh, a number of uh, hosts here in Eugene. Oregon. Um, and then uh, let me stop there. So as you can see, it's it's not the most ideal workflow for someone who's wanting to do uh, either research or someone in the network operations community that's wanting to operationalize route views data. Um, so we've seen these shortcomings in our kind of data access model and um, essentially generation two of our uh, route views data distribution model uh, seeks to address those. So that's the second generation characteristics. Um, we're using a message based data distribution model with uh, per message timestamps and metadata about the messages themselves. Uh, we have automated consolidating and sequencing. Uh, we're working on database storage and access for all of this data. Uh, or at least um, you know, within a certain time period, uh, RESTful interfaces into that data, uh, and then real-time streaming telemetry of uh, the global BGP data that uh, we're all very familiar with. And that's actually um, another demonstration that I'll show you guys here at the end of the presentation. Uh, and then finally, there's a middle layer abstraction. So, um, as a client, you don't necessarily need to know the underlying infrastructure. You just really need to know what AS or um, exchange you're interested in to be able to gain access to that data. So from there, we'll jump into a, a couple of uh, frequently asked questions about route views. Um, and if you guys have any questions along those lines, please uh, let us know. Uh, but I'll just kind of continue on here. Uh, oh, sorry, uh, that's actually our FAQ page. If you're interested or have any frequently asked questions about route views, uh, you can find them there. Uh, and then there's a couple of route views how to's uh, that we're going to show you guys here. Um, and these are essentially commands that can be run on any of our route views collectors. Uh, and if you're looking for a list of those collectors, you can go to our map uh, at the link there. So kind of the, the most common use case that we run into a lot is, uh, you know, what routes am I advertising? Um, if you're familiar with Cisco IOS, uh, FRR and Quagga are very similar to Cisco IOS. So most of the commands that you use there are applicable here on our collectors. So in this case, if you're looking to see what routes you're advertising, 
you can do something like show IP BGP regex and then your ASN. Um, if you're looking for the best path of a prefix, uh, you might do something like this, where you say show IP BGP, your prefix, and then best path. Uh, most of you are, are probably fairly familiar with this type of syntax. Um, some of the more interesting things that you can do with our data is actually get an understanding of where uh, I'm peered at within the route views collector infrastructure. So as we publish those peering stats, you could do something pretty uh, straightforward, like curl that page and just grep for your AS. And you'll see uh, the collector where you're peer peered at, and that can easily be used to tell net to that collector. OK, uh, so something that we've done recently with, uh, within the route views collector infrastructure is we've enabled RPKI. Uh, and if you're familiar with RPKI, uh, I'll try and kind of keep it brief, but essentially it's a resource public key infrastructure. We're using public keys to sign uh, route origin authorization um, to essentially say your routes are coming from where they're supposed to be. Um, and here's a, a quick example of that. So AS6501 is advertising 10 slash 8 that's validated by the RARs and synced to an RPKI validator, which is then uh, 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 synced to our route views collectors via the RPKI RTR protocol. Uh, so all of the modern route views collectors are connected to a validator at this point. Um, and it's worth noting that we don't filter or drop any routes based on RPKI state. That's simply there for you as an operator to look at that RPKI state from a neutral third party. Uh, so the, the two useful uh, things that you can do on our modern collectors is uh, take a look at the RPKI state for a given prefix. And you can do that by saying show RPKI prefix and then the prefix you're looking for. In addition to that, you can also go dump the entire RPKI table in the CLI by saying show RPKI prefix table. Um, you can get a look or take a look at the uh, collectors that are RPKI enabled by going to our map here and just filtering based on RPKI. Uh, and that'll show you where those modern collectors are that are running RPKI. We've also been working on providing some of this RPKI data from a REST interface. Uh, so as you can see, we've got a couple of quick examples here where we're looking at the validation state for prefix 1.1.1.0 uh, slash 24. Um, and that's just a simple curl command. You can do something similar for a given ASN um, and it will provide all of the different prefixes that are registered there. Uh, it's worth noting that anything that's not found will, will show up as not found. Anything that's valid will be tagged as valid. And then obviously anything that's invalid will be tagged as invalid. Uh, those entries get generated every two hours. Uh, and you can grab an entire dump of that RPKI state of not found, valid, and invalid in JSON format by curling the URL there at the bottom of the page. Uh, just be aware that that's a, a fairly large uh, document at that point, and you might need to give yourself some time to, to pull that all the way down. So one of the things that uh, we talked about in the second generation of our route views data distribution model was real-time streaming telemetry. Uh, at the heart of this, there's two kind of, uh, well, three route views components. Um, and the first one is BMP or BGP monitoring protocol. Uh, that's another RFC standard. Um, it's supported by most major vendors at this point, Cisco, Juniper, Arista, and FRR, which is um, what our software uh, collectors are based on. Um, in addition to the MRT data, we also get um, some additional attributes. So we see um, BMP start and stop. We see the peer up and peer down information when a, a peering state changes on our collectors. 
uh, we get a collector ID and we also get BGP statistics via BMP, um, which is an interesting thing that we're able to pull out of those. Um, our BMP collection uh, infrastructure is based on a, a Linux Foundation project called OpenBMPD. Uh, it consolidates peers and collectors, um, and it's able to split collectors and peers and uh, update messages into separate streams, which is very useful if you're only looking for a specific AS or if you're only looking for a specific exchange. Um, the Back end of the OpenBMPD uh, uh, platform uses Apache Kafka, uh, which is compri uh, comprises the message bus for OpenBMP. Um, Kafka does a great job of addressing any sort of uh, consumer producer problems that you have in terms of queuing. Uh, it's been proven to scale many times. It has a very mature client API. You can, if you can program, you can find a Kafka client in the language that you're interested in, um, and it can be easily extended to meet future needs. So here's a quick, uh, just overview of what that looks like um, from an infrastructure standpoint. At the bottom of the screen, we have our route views BGP peers. Uh, that would be you folks at Lynx, hopefully. Uh, your, your eBGP peered with our route views collector at Lynx, and then our route views collector at Lynx uh, speaks BMP back to our open BMP servers. Uh, and then that data is pushed into Kafka, where it can then be consumed by any of the client APIs or applications that are able to uh, read Kafka. So it's worth noting that um, to, to kind of give you guys a brief overview of, of how Kafka uh, separates data within different streams. Uh, it uses something called topics. And what topics are, are essentially a category or a feed name to which messages are stored and published. Um, OpenBMP uses three types of topics. Uh, the one that you guys are all going to be uh, interested in is the raw BMP messages. Um, and those are grouped by the collector group, which in our case is always route views. Uh, and then we have a router group, which is the uh, collector at a given exchange. So every exchange will be its own router group. And then we have the peer ASN, which is the obviously the ASN who is peering with us. So what we end up with is a single string that identifies uh, a given uh, collector and peer at an exchange. Uh, and one of the awesome things about Kafka is it supports a subscription pattern to allow you to use a regex to get uh, uh, more data than just what might be available in a single stream. Uh, so for example, there, uh, for example, here, the pattern that we have, um, we're matching against 65, uh, 16509 against any collector. Uh, and that would essentially subscribe us to any updates or withdrawals from uh, Amazon's ASN. Uh, if we wanted to look at our multi-hop collectors, we could just subscribe to the multi-hop collectors and see any of the ASN updates from uh, that are peered with those multi-hop collectors. Um, in terms of BMP tools, there's one that we really like to focus on, uh, and that's BGP Stream. That's a product that's developed and uh, produced by uh, CADA, which is a research group here within the US. It's the, I'm going to try and get this right, the Center for Applied Internet Data Analysis. Um, and BGP Stream is great because it will read both MRT and BMP data. Um, so it's very useful if you want to look uh, both in terms of real time and historical data from a single um, tool or interface. If you're interested in what other languages have a Kafka client, uh, the link there, there at the bottom uh, has a pretty exhaustive list of where you can get those clients and in what languages. Okay, um, and here's another quick how-to uh, in terms of how to use BGP Stream. Uh, the CLI interface to BGP Stream is called BGP Reader. I'm actually gonna show you this in a little bit. Um, 
So essentially all we're doing here is we're telling BGP Reader which project we want to use, which is the route views stream project. That's our Kafka data. Um, and then the dash R is telling us which exchange or collector we want to subscribe to. Um, and I'm not going to go through all the details in, in this output here, uh, but essentially the, the highlights are, you know, we, we identify it as an update, as an announcement, uh, the timestamp, the OpenBMP uh, server, and then as you can see, there's a number of different PGP related fields there in terms of the prefix uh, and communities or AS path. So there's a lot of data that's compressed into a, a, a very small uh, output, which is uh, makes BGP stream really great for any sort of uh, operational tools that you might want to use. And here's a couple of quick flags that you can use with BGP Reader that make it very easy to slice and dice that data and get exactly what you want. Uh, again, I'm not going to go through them all. I'll just kind of give you guys a second to peruse those before we move on. Okay, so BGP Stream uh, is actually uh, based on a number of different libraries and tools. Uh, two of them that, well, the one that really uh, comprises the foundation of BGP Stream is libbgp Stream. Uh, that's a C uh, or C++ API. So if there's any C or C++ programmers out there, you can wrap this uh, data interface into your uh, uh, business use cases, um, whatever that may be. Uh, there's also a Python bindings for the, the C libraries, uh, which make it very easy to use in Python. I'll show you guys that here in a little bit as well. Uh, and then finally, we have our route views map. Uh, and I think I'm going to actually go ahead and just open this up because I'd like to show this to you guys real quick. Hopefully, um, you can still see that. Um, and give it a second here. So we've done a little bit of work in, in terms of trying to make our uh, the locations of our route views collectors a little more easy to know and understand and identify. Uh, so we've worked on this map to uh, essentially Put a better interface into that data, and as you can see, we can we can uh, get in here and filter any of these uh, devices by RPKI or BMP, which makes it easy to identify which ones are going to support those uh, features. Oh, sorry, and then um, that's the end of the demonstration. So I just want to say uh, thank you to the Lynx community. Uh, you guys have always been a, a, a big supporter of route views, both through your peering and uh, your help in terms of keeping the project going. Uh, your contributions are invaluable. Um, so we really appreciate the, the fact that you guys continue to, to help support us. Uh, and if there's any questions about that, uh, let's go ahead and answer those before we jump into the demonstrations. I don't see any in the um, Q&A currently, but as I said, if you use the Q&A function along the bottom of your um, Zoom screen to ask all your questions, and then we can put those forward to David and the guys. Perfect. Okay. Well, so if there's no Q&A, I will go ahead and jump into a couple of these quick demos of uh, BGP Stream. Um, and we'll just go from there. So let's see here. Um, are you guys able to, to see that as well? We're still seeing um, your review. Oh, there we go. How about now? Yes, we are. OK. Uh, so I'll start with uh, BGP Reader. That's the, the CLI interface into the BGP stream. Um, and as you can see here, uh, similar to the slides that we saw, I'm just listing the project here, uh, and then I'm I'm uh, selecting links as the uh, router that I'm wanting to listen to here. Uh, and I'm not expecting you guys uh, or girls or the community here to to really parse any of this data. I just kind of want you to understand how easy it is to get real time data out of the route views uh, infrastructure now. So if I hit enter here and I give it a, a second to start collecting data, usually it takes a, a little bit here. 
Uh, as you can see, this is real time streaming BGP output uh, from the links collector from any of the ASNs that are paired with us. Um, and what's nice about this is you can, you can use your typical Linux uh, command line tools to actually filter on this data in a very easy and meaningful way. Uh, so if you're looking for a specific prefix or AS path, uh, that's just a simple grep uh, away from uh, where you are today. Uh, so I think that's a, a pretty uh, great uh, means of using this as a quick and dirty operational tool uh, to help you identify any issues that you might uh, see. So let me stop that. And then it's it's easy enough to change this to, you know, any other collectors that we have, and you can just refer back to the, to the map to get a better understanding of what's available there. Uh, and then I also threw together a couple of quick um, high BGP stream examples. Uh, and I'll jump into those right now, just so any of my uh, Python folks out there have a, a quick chance to see how easy it is to, to operationalize this data within uh, a Python script. Uh, so all I've done is imported PyBGP BGP stream. I've instantiated that object and I've told, her, told it that I want to look at the links router, much like I did in BGP reader. Uh, and then what all I'm doing here is essentially printing the same uh, element type output um, that we saw from BGP reader. So with any luck, if I go ahead and run this, give it a second. And there you go. So we, we see a, a very similar output. So any sort of business logic that you might want to capture in a Python script or a module or any of the different platforms um, that you as network operators use, it's very easy to get this data um, via Python. Uh, just a couple more examples there. We'll look at another one where we're uh, Let's see, what are we doing here? Uh, we're splitting the AS path uh, and we're able to filter on a specific member in that AS path. Uh, again, we're using Amazon here as an example, um, but here's, it's basically a, a nice straightforward example about how you could um, filter on your own AS, ASN to watch for prefixes that you're advertising or if there's uh, some other ASN or AS path that you're interested in, uh, very easy to, to do that from just a simple Python script. Um, I don't know if I really think that's, that I need to run that one. Uh, we'll just kind of skip the output on that one. And then finally, this one, we combine two of the different APIs that we have. Uh, we're using the RPKI API and the live data um, from, well, let's just change this to links and, and see what we get um, to essentially validate RP or prefixes as they come in uh, for RPKI uh, validation. So let me give that a try real quick. There we go. So as you can see, uh, if I stop this from scrolling for a second, uh, we've got the V6 prefix here, we've got the ASN, uh, and then we can see that it's either not found or seen as valid. And then we have the timestamp uh, for that validation as well. So something very easy that uh, you could use to, to get up and running with any sort of RPKI uh, monitoring that you're wanting to do for your network operations. Uh, and that's all that I had today. So if there's any questions about that, I'm happy to answer those. Um, if not, thank you to Holly and Mo and the rest of the Lynx uh, crew for having us on. And we appreciate you guys' uh, continued support. All right, thank you, David. Um, again, not seeing um, any Q and A's um, pop up just yet. Um, wait a few uh, seconds for that. I think people are, it's still quite early um, for some people or late for you, right. um, David and Philip. 
uh, here we go. So one from Ivan. Um, are there API and other infrastructure items central or any cast? Uh, central or any cast? Are the oh, uh, so right now these APIs are all central. Um, we're trying to work with uh, a number of partners to get the the Kafka uh, clusters distributed. So we could mirror those to different clusters that might be uh, more geographically beneficial to our various users. Um, so that's the long-term goal. But right now, those APIs are uh, uh, centrally located at the University of Oregon. But that's a good question. Thank you, Ivan. Um, and then, Mo, do you have anything um, from a Lynx point of view? So I'll stay with Yes. Yeah. Uh, one of my one of my colleagues actually has asked, uh, "Do you is there any plans to move away from Telnet to use maybe SSH or?" Yeah. So the that's always uh, one of the interesting ones we get, um, and we've looked at that a number of times. And really, the the tough part is is we use uh, SSH to manage these hosts. Um, so there's a little bit of a conflict there where we would you know essentially have to give anyone and everyone. SSH into the box or run SSH on a different port. Um, so right now, um, we don't have any plans to do that. Uh, and really, this data is all public. So and we don't require any passwords. So there's nothing really to uh, hide in our data, I guess, uh, for lack of a better term. Um, so yeah. Thank you. Good question, though. Lovely, thank you. And Philip, do you have anything to add to the conversation? Um, well, not, not in particular as from pulling data off all the route views, but, you know, from as far as the operational community goes, um, you know, the major use, at least, you know, from route views point of, point of view, you know, from like a network operator and, and so forth, especially the network operators, um, is just the availability of ready access to to see what the BGP table looks like in different parts of the world. And that, that's the big advantage. Mm -hmm. I mean, we can go to a lot of places where there's a lot of a collection of what a BGP table might look like in various uh, countries or economies. But mm -hmm. the, the great advantage in, well, I, don't, you know, I, I suppose in Europe, but you know, for me sitting here in Brisbane, Australia, when I'm helping people in the Pacific Islands, especially do troubleshooting, it's, okay, what do my routes look like from the point of view of North America? What do they look like from the point of view of Sydney? Because there's a right views node there. Or even in Singapore, because um, there's a right views, you know, right views node there. And so being able to mm -hmm. actually log into the different nodes and just doing a quick show IP BGP or looking at the RPKI table there has actually quite a big, um, just, you know, quite a big troubleshooting advantage. Um, and so it's just getting folks to, understand that they can simply log into these places. We all know about looking glasses, which is very much a web interface. We know about bgp.he.net, which is again, using a lot of route views data to get access to it. But um, I don't know, a lot of the people I'm working with, it's very much, oh, I can telnet into something. <laughs> I can get access to a router and just see, wow, I can get all this useful information directly like that. And that's really the, the very, very big win that so many people have. So. You know, for me, it's always been very important. Let's get more of these right views nodes out. And you know, I've been working with David to try and get a few more in South Asia and the Middle East and so forth, uh, improve the view in Africa as well, so that we can, uh, you know, it's not just for benefiting the local internet in those places, but for folks from other places who are trying to figure out like, so why is my routing going all the way around the world when it really should be mm -hmm. doing these few short hops? And they can actually see the paths and so forth. Um, and, you know, and, you know, people, even though the, the route views nodes in various places, um, they, they only get transit from the place that actually hosts them. So it doesn't give you what the trace route is going to look like through any different operator. The fact that right. sitting in Johannesburg, I can do a trace route through the host, it's still giving me a pretty good idea of well, how do I get from South Africa to somewhere in the middle of the Pacific or South Asia or, or whatever? And so those are the, the real valuable things that um, you know, I'm, I'm always introducing to, to folks everywhere about route views. And 
I don't know, it's been running, as David said, you know, for how many years? Since, well, 1990, early something. And I've been using yeah. it since 1990, early something. We still come across people who go, oh, what's Rock Fuse? What does it do? Mm -hmm. So, you know, and as David said, we really appreciate the, you know, the opportunity to, to talk more about it because, you know, we've been in the industry for many, many years, but a lot of the newcomers just don't seem to be aware of some of these amazing facilities that, that actually have been around for such a long time and data going back to, well, pretty much, you know, before, well, what's the, what do people think is the internet now? I mean, people always talk about web as being internet and now apparently, well, here in Australia, internet is just Facebook and nothing else at all. So it's, you know, letting folks know that actually this infrastructure has been around and it's being improved, you know, the amazing work that the right fuse folks have been doing just to make it more accessible is um, just of great benefit. So it's not a question for David, but it's really more kind of a sharing some of the experiences that, um, you know, at least I've been seeing and been helping with and all the, the BGP work that I've been doing with operators around this part of the world. Yeah, and Philip and NSRC have, have been a huge help uh, to me uh, just in, in terms of increasing that footprint and trying to get a better view into different regions of the world that are uh, undercovered for lack of a, a better term. And we've been uh, pretty successful in that in the last couple of years and have been very thankful to be able to work with them and you know folks like Mo at Lynx who are, are willing to help support us. And it's been pretty great. Uh, so Ivan brought up a, another point uh, about Telnet. Um, you know, Telnet in terms of the you know TCP21 is a port that we can probably move away from uh, in the future. The the thing that is tough with uh, how we operate the collectors is we actually bind the BGP daemon VTY to a TCP socket. Um, and there's no uh, there's no SSH or lib SSH library there to, to do any of the uh, key exchange. So even though it might be on a different port, it will likely never leverage SSH unless we change how we manage that infrastructure. So there's kind of the a little more justification as to why that exists the way it does today. Perfect. And then just um, a comment from Mike um, along the same sort of points. The more germane point um, about Telnet support is the appreciation of the Telnet clients. Yep. And there's probably some, some ways that we can at least get away from the Telnet port and use um, some other client that's just a bare socket. Um, but yeah, that's a good point and something that we should certainly start to, to look at and come up with a plan for. Great. So, Philip, just coming back to you. So, you said um, that a few people have come up to you and um, the new people. How would you um, explain root views in a very simple view to the new people um, coming into the industry? Um, just in a very simple term, it's it's the ability to log into a router somewhere on the planet, in many different places around the planet, and actually see live what the BGP table looks like from from that point of view. Uh, that's the big advantage over everything else. And it's, you know, it's not like it's a competition between the other people who provide BGP views. They're all extraordinarily valuable tools, but the big win and, you know, when the light goes on and people realize, what, I can actually log in? Um, you know, that's quite an amazing thing. Back in the late 80s, early 90s, we were logging into things all over the world and we didn't think about it. Um, but of course, nowadays, you cannot log into somebody else's infrastructure. And so having this facility that you can just log into and see live what's actually going on with your routes and how to get to your network, uh, that's a massive advantage that is just not available with anything else. Perfect, thank you. And Mo, do you have any um, anything to add to that? Kind of what are the advantages for links um, on using I think it's a, it's a good uh, it's it's a good training tool for for for, for people who are you know who are new to the industry as well. Uh, we've 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 used it for for trying to you know in case some cases we've used it for trying to catch members who are announcing our network range for some of the lands and stuff. So it's you know it's it's a very useful tool and it gives you a, it complements our, our other looking glasses as well. I think you know, it gives us a wider look into the internet. So uh, yeah. I think that I've, I've, always, I've been using it 
since I started in the industry as well. So it's a very valuable tool to use. Great, so thank you. So a uh, question in the chat, can anyone peer with you views? Uh, yes, anyone can peer, well, anyone with an ASN and uh, BGP speaking router can peer with route views. Uh, you can do that at an exchange. Um, and the easiest way to, to look at that is either the route views map that we have, or just go to peering DB and look for AS6447. Um, but yeah, and if you're not on an exchange we're at, uh, as I mentioned in the presentation, we can set up a, a multi-hop peering. Great, so thank you. So that's it for questions. If you've got any last minute burning um, questions, if you add them to the chat, but I'll come back to you, David, just to close it. Have you got any like final closing comments? Uh, again, I, I think I just want to thank the community and, and the folks that uh, wanted to jump on and take a look at route views and, and see the new and interesting things that we're doing with it today. Uh, and thanks uh, to Lynx again for, for having us here and hosting this uh, uh, webinar. No, that's perfect. Thank you so much. Right. Thank you all for um, joining us today. So as I said, this session um, has been recorded and will be live on our Learn With Links page um, in a few days, along with our other content. So we really hope you enjoyed this session. Thank you again to David, Philip and Mo for walking us through. Um, and we hopefully we can see you at our uh, next virtual event soon. Thank you all so much for joining us. Thanks, everyone.